Now, this again, taste is very, very much linked up with smell. So let's get into it. Let's talk about taste, also known as uh, gustation, right? Gustation, gustatory system, right? it's all taste. Um, so we're gonna talk about the different nerves that are associated with taste, right? There's like two obvious ones, cranial nerve seven and cranial nerve nine, right? Remember cranial nerve seven, which part of the tongue is that? Good, cranial nerve nine, good. Cranial nerve 10 is also gonna be associated with taste. You have taste receptors in the pharynx, you have taste receptors in your esophagus. So whenever you're swallowing something, whenever you're eating something, like you got taste receptors all over the place. So you're actually able to detect flavor with cranial nerve 10 as well. And then we're gonna discuss the primary gustatory cortex. <clears throat> and then we're gonna discuss the taste buds, not in so much detail because that's more like AMP type of stuff. But then we're going to discuss agusia and dysgusia, right? Which can also very much play into anosmia. Now, if you have anosmia, you're probably also going to have agusia as well. You're not going to be able to taste much. We're going to talk about transduction of the signals when you actually stimulate those receptors. We're going to talk about uh, taste receptors as well as how the microbiome can come into play as well. Uh, we're going to talk about how taste, vision, smell, all that is basically going to stimulate uh, basically like feeding type of reactions, right? When you smell food, when you see food, right? You get like the cephalic phase of eating, right? You have the cephalic, you have the gastro, uh, gastric phase, right? Cephalic phase is literally just thinking about food, smelling food. All of a sudden you start getting a physiological reaction, like you're hungry, right? That has to do with like, for example, gastrin. You guys remember gastrin from AMP, from the G cells in your stomach get released even before you put food in your mouth, right? And that starts to like allow for gastric secretions to be released. And your, your stomach starts to churn, you get gastric motility, right? So all these different neuronal uh, stimuli are going to contribute to that type of reaction. Um, trigeminal sensations, right? Touch, right? The sensation of foods. Um, and then we're going to talk about plasticity and changing uh, how tastes change. Does anybody like lingua? Tacos de lingua? Have you ever had it before? Who here has had tacos de lingua? I think I've had um, pretty good. It's really good. The trick is don't look at it when you're eating it because the and I, I've, I'm pretty like you know adventurous when it comes to like cuisine. But like even when I had tacos de lingua one time, I looked at it and I could just see the taste buds. I'm like. I'm basically making out with a, a cow right now. <laughs> so, I was like, I was a little, little bit repulsed, but I still ate it anyway. <laughs> you can't look at it raw, but even cooked, you can still see the taste buds in the meat. Yeah, it does. But when you see those taste buds, it don't look like steak. <laughs> it looks like a freaking tongue. It's like you're making out with your taco. <laughs> uh, tacos, the cabeza. That's, I think that's like the best. Yeah, those are. Really oh yeah, I love tripe. Menudo. Menudo is awesome, man. My mom used to make that one as a kid. Freaked me out at first because it's like very rubbery. Right? And then if you have trichophobia or tripophobia, right? And the tripophobia is where you're like scared of holes. Yeah. It's weird because it's got that honeycomb look to it. But it's great, especially with the trick peas. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, tripe is awesome. So here's the major different types of uh, flavors. You got sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umame, umami. Um, your textbook was spelling this different. It was spelling it unami with an N. So yeah, that was a little weird, but it's umami, U-M-A-M-I. Other flavors that you might be able to taste as well, like metallic flavors, obviously you could taste certain metals, right? Um, carbonation can be considered a flavor. Fat can also uh, be considered a flavor, right? All those things can be considered flavors as well. Um, and everyone's gonna be different, right? Yeah, it's like texture, well, metallic is not, well, you could taste metal, right? You can get that metallic flavor. If you bit your tongue and you bled out in your mouth and you can taste the blood, it's the iron in the blood that you're tasting. So it's got that metallic flavor to it. So 
here's the major things going on in uh, glute station. Make sure you're familiar with your cranial nerves here. So you have your cranial nerve seven, right? Your facial nerve, uh, uh, glossopharyngeal nerve, and then you have your vagus nerve. Those are all going to be involved in taste. So anterior two thirds of the tongue, seven, posterior one third, nine, and then you have uh, the esophagus and other areas with cranial nerve 10 innervating taste buds there. Um, where in the brain is taste going to be uh, uh, processed? It's going to be in the nucleus of the solitary tract. This is also referred to as the nucleus solitarius. The nucleus of the solitary tract is totally fine. That's going to be within the medulla. Um, and then you're going to have uh, regions that are reaching all the way to the thalamus. So you have the ventral posterior medial nucleus of the thalamus being activated. So remember, the thalamus, super important for processing sensory afferent information. So taste being one of those types of sensory afferents. And then eventually the gustatory cor cortex and other areas that are associated with the gustatory cortex are going to be stimulated. Um, the gustatory cortex is going to be found within the insula. Okay, so it's going to be deep in the brain. Remember, the insula is insulated. You have to pry apart the sylvian fissure to be able to see the insula. And that's where you find the uh, gustatory cortex. Frontal cortex is also going to be involved in that as well. So here's your primary gustatory cortex. Again, the insula is going to be one of the major structures. Um, you have to, again, pry apart that region to be able to get into it. So it's sylvian fissure, you have to pry apart the frontal lobe and the, the temporal lobe. Um, and then, yeah, so that's the main area where you're processing taste. So let's watch a short minute. This is the two minute neuroscience. Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience, where I explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss taste. The tongue is covered with many little bumps, which are sometimes mistakenly called taste buds. These small lumps of tissue, however, are known as papillae. Taste buds are found in the walls of papillae and the grooves surrounding them. Each taste bud contains anywhere from 50 to 150 taste receptor cells. Extending from these cells are fine microvilli, sometimes called taste hairs or gustatory hairs, which protrude through an opening called the taste pore into the mouth. These microvilli come in contact with substances in the mouth that can be tasted, also known as tastins. Tastins interact with taste receptor cells through a number of different mechanisms to depolarize the cells. When taste cells are depolarized, they release neurotransmitters that stimulate sensory neurons that travel on cranial nerves 7, 9, and 10. These neurons terminate on neurons in the nucleus of the solitary tract in the medulla. From there, taste information is sent to the thalamus. Then, taste information is sent to the gustatory cortex, which is a region of the cerebral cortex found along the border between the anterior insula and a structure called the frontal operculum. The gustatory cortex allows us to consciously discriminate different taste stimuli. The taste information sent along these pathways is thought to encode for basic tastes, such as sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and savory or umami. Whether there are others is still being debated. However, the actual flavor of a food, which is what we typically define as taste, is created by a combination of taste and olfactory information. So in other words, all those sense all those special senses are going to be really important to communicate together to figure out exactly what you are tasting. So again, make sure you know the insula is going to be one of the primary areas. So the anterior insula, and then again, the frontal opercular region is going to be involved in that too. So here's the whole system. Again, you have cranial nerves number seven, uh, nine, and 10. Uh, don't worry about the location of these taste buds. I'm not going to test you on that. So, but if you want to go into it, that's fine. So cranial nerve seven, you're going to have taste buds that are on the palate, right? The palate's going to be the roof of your mouth, anterior two thirds of your tongue. Uh, cranial nerve number nine. Uh, well, actually know the regions of the tongue. Sorry. You know, need to know the anterior region, anterior two thirds, posterior one third. De definitely make sure you know that as well as the, uh, the cranial nerve 10 where you find those taste buds. But, uh, what I was meaning to say is don't worry about what type of flavors are perceived on what type of taste buds. 
because different taste buds are going to perceive either sweet, sour, salty, umami, and all that. I don't care about that for this class. What I do care about is where those uh, regions of the tongue and regions of your mouth or other areas where you do find those types of taste buds. Okay. Um, again, cranular 10, that's going to be pharynx, esophagus, right? Then it's going to send those signals to the uh, brainstem, the nucleus solitarius or the nucleus of the solitary tract, to the thalamus. Then from the thalamus, you're going to get um, some back and forth communication as well. So you're going to see this information is going to be sent to the primary gustatory cortex, right? So within the insula. Then information is going to be sent to the limbic system, hypothalamus, amygdala, right? Figuring out exactly what to do about what you're tasting, right? Amygdala, again, amygdala is going to be really important for threats, uh, threat perception. So if you're seeing that this flavor is from a potentially dangerous thing that you're consuming, the amygdala is going to fire off. And then they're going to cross communicate. So you're going to get communication between the hypothalamus as well as the, as the brainstem, the amygdala as well, as well as the brainstem. So in other words, you get bidirectional communication from these different regions. If you know the major regions, though, you should be good, right? So know like the primary gustatory cortex, um, know the area of the uh, brainstem that's associated with taste, and know your cranial nerves associated with taste as well. Again, taste buds, you find them in the tongue, you find them in a the soft palate, right, on the roof of your mouth. You find them in the larynx, pharynx, and the esophagus. Uh, they're going to be clustered up all together. Um, they have uh, microvilli and there's taste pores as well. So the uh, taste pores basically allow for, or sorry, microvilli allow for maximum surface area. Taste pores where the, uh, the actual taste in is detected. Okay. <clears throat> what else do you need to know here? And so here's another image of that. So you have your taste pore. There's going to be microvilli as well to increase the amount of surface area. So you're able to actually detect those different types of taste ints. Um, in this case, gustatory afferents are going to innervate with receptor cells within the bud. You're also going to see trigeminal nerve is going to come into play that, uh, here as well. Um, because remember, trigeminal nerve is associated also with uh, like tactile sensations right? Feeling. And so you can actually feel what you're uh, consuming as well. Now, these are going to be different types of taste buds. Um, still debating whether or not I want to test you on what they actually taste, like what they detect. I probably won't, to be honest with you. But type one has been thought to maybe uh, be involved with like salty type flavors. It's also going to serve the role that's similar to astrocytes, um, aka like glia type, uh, glia type supportive cell. Those are your type one taste buds. Type two is going to uh, be responsive to many more different types of flavors, right? Taste ins like sweet, bitter, umami, and salt. Um, the neurotransmitter involved in type two is going to be ATP uh, versus type three which is going to be dealing with sour and salty. Uh, those are going to be dealing with more uh, 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 chemoreceptor activation. So it's not going to be involving um, ATP activation. So let's go into those in a little bit of detail uh, momentarily. So type 2, those are G protein coupled uh, receptors. So in other words, you stimulate that G protein and you're going to initiate a downstream second messenger cascade. And again, ATP is going to be one of the major things involved in that process at the end of the cascade. Versus type 3 taste buds are going to be dealing with ions. So in other words, you have ions coming in to allow for different types of flavors. Think about like the flavor of sour. When something is sour, what does that mean? Is it basic or is it acidic? Yeah, it's acidic. What makes something acidic? Yeah, absolutely. Hydrogen ions, right? So you're basically detect detecting the ions, the hydrogen ions, when you're tasting something acidic, right? Salt, you can also see some salt being involved in these type 3 taste buds as well. And salt, what's salt? Yeah, NaCl, but salts in general are, are like 
ions that basically come apart when put in water, put into solution. Huh? I find it so weird to think of it like that. Yeah. So like sodium chloride, you got potassium chloride, you got all sorts of different types of salts, right? Salts just basically uh, go into like come apart when they go into solution, right? They disassociate. So those are your type 3 receptors on your taste buds. Again, I'm still determining whether or not I want to test you on those. If like type 2 is G protein couple versus type 3, which is ion channel, right? And what type of taste are going to be uh, associated with that. So maybe put a star on there. That might be important. I might, I might test you on that. Huh? The type 2 versus type 3 taste receptors. I might test you on what, whether or not they're G protein versus ion channel and thereby what kind of flavors might be associated with, with those, All right. All right, now agusia and dysgusia, and this is gonna be heavily associated with the loss of smell, right? So when you lose smell, you're very much likely to lose your sense of taste. Again, going back to uh, COVID, right? COVID-19, which you saw binding to the ACE receptor, ACE2 receptors that you find in your olfactory sustentacular cells, the supportive cells, causing inflammation, destruction of the respiratory, uh, sorry, the olfactory uh, receptors. Um, that's going to affect your ability to taste, right? One third of all people who got COVID-19 developed um, agusia, myself included. I couldn't taste a single thing which was the only time I drank flavored vodka. <laughs> it's like, this stuff is disgusting. I'm never going to drink it, but now is the time to do it. I yeah. Have a crazy story. We were at a party, and one of my friends was a little bit drunk. Yeah. He had COVID. We didn't know that. And he started drinking from a water bottle that he thought was water. Oh. And he couldn't taste, and it was entirely vodka. Oh. And like, he Oh, and then, that's like, awful. Somebody came over and was like, oh my God. And then we all like... Was he okay? Yeah, the story gets crazier after that. Like, okay, the, okay. I'll way. have to hear that story sometime. I'll have to hear that story sometime. If you... There's people who have actually drank like a whole bottle of hard liquor and they die from that. I think, I think the lethal... Only if you drink it at once, right? Okay. So it's, it's lethal if you drink it, if you flood your system with alcohol. I forget how many shots it is that you can actually, like a lot of people die from drinking that many shots. Like, you know, you've heard about people who turn 21 and they'll take 21 shots to celebrate and they die, right? So, yeah, it's... Uh... Maybe make it three shots. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I want to see if this video is worth watching. Today's video topic is causes of loss of taste and how to regain it. We all know the importance of taste. It is one of the five senses that help us navigate the world and enjoy our favorite foods. So a loss of taste can be a frustrating and concerning problem. But luckily, in most cases, it is not a serious medical issue. So here are some of the possible causes of loss of taste and what you can do about it. Number one, COVID-19. One of the most common causes of loss of taste is the COVID-19 virus. The virus is highly contagious and can cause a wide range of symptoms, including a loss of taste and smell. The good news is that in most cases, the patients regained their loss of taste within 21 days. Number two, infections. Infections such as colds and flu are another common cause of loss of taste. These question. infections can cause inflammation in the nose and throat, which can lead to a loss of taste but you will normally regain your sense of taste when the infection is treated. However, some viral infection can do permanent damage to the taste of the patients. Number three, nasal polyps. Nasal polyps are painless growths that can form in the nose. They can be caused by inflammation from allergies, infections, or asthma. They can block the flow of air and cause a loss of smell and taste. To treat the loss of taste and smell, the doctor may prescribe drugs to reduce the size of these polyps or sometimes surgery is recommended. Number four, cancer. Cancer can cause a loss of taste. Cancer of the mouth, throat, or esophagus can cause a loss of taste. Cancer treatment, such as radiation therapy to the head or neck, can also cause a loss of taste, but it usually resolves once the treatment is stopped. Number five, allergies and sinus problems. 
Allergies and sinus problems are common causes of loss of taste. They can cause inflammation and congestion of the nose and throat, which can lead to a loss of taste. But in most cases, they can be treated with nasal sprays or antibiotics. Number six, dental problem. Dental problems such as tooth decay or gum disease or infections can cause a loss of taste. These problems can cause inflammation of the mouth and throat, which can lead to loss of taste. Treating the dental problem will help you regain your taste. All right, so you guys get the uh, you guys get the gist. Lots of things can affect your flavor. Uh, so if you lose it completely, that's agusia. If you lose you know, the sense of flavor where you have a hard time discriminating between different flavors or things just kind of taste off, that's when we talk about dysgeusia, right? So you're not getting a perfect uh, bearing on what you're actually tasting. Well, agusia, I mean, you're losing it completely, right? And when I, I remember getting the, the worst, when I got COVID for the first time, because I had it multiple times, but the first time that I got the really bad one, uh, it was depressing. When you can't taste things, like it's really depressing. Like. I know, right, exactly. Like, I like my wine, I like steaks, I like all sorts of stuff. And like, I couldn't enjoy any of it. And I couldn't, you know, I couldn't imagine living like your whole life not being able to taste anything. Like, absolutely, really. You know. I've never, gotten cold. I have a question. never? You're lucky. Yes. The taste buds, do they um, like have like a life? Do they come off? I. Like, don't actually know the answer to that question. Like, what's the lifespan of a taste bud? I don't know how to ask that question. Yeah. I like that thing, like, you get your taste buds every seven years. Really? Taste bud cells undergo continual turnover even in adulthood, and their average lifespan has been estimated approximately 10 days. Mm-hmm. However, it's not clear whether this figure can be applied to all different cell types contained in the taste bud. This is an article... Uh, on the NIH website, uh, written by uh, Hamamichi and colleagues, published in 2006. So, pretty interesting. So, it says that there's a lot of turnover in your taste buds. So, that's a really good question. Problem with our food? Because, like, what I, I know this is so, so awful. Yeah, it's not awful. Um, what I do is I do tongue scraping every single morning. Do you really? Like when you brush your teeth, mm-hmm. you're supposed to you're supposed to brush your tongue too, right? Yeah, but yeah. if you do tongue scraping, like yeah, and you brush the tongue, and you brush the tongue. So tongue scraping, what, what does the tongue scraping do? It basically just kind of removes all the dead epithelium and stuff. You're supposed to do it right when you wake up because your body excretes when you're sleeping. Huh? Because you drink water or something, you put it back into your body. Oh, interesting. It's nasty. Yeah, it's interesting. Nasty. Huh? Yeah. That's really cool. So I was thinking, like, I just. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you feel like that actually improves your sense of taste? Really? <laughs> that's awesome. That's very cool. So again, type 2 and type 3 taste buds, those are like the major ones that are associated with flavor. Type 1 might be associated with salt as well. Remember, type 2, G protein coupled receptor, also ion receptor for the sensation of salt. But then type 3 is going to be mostly ion uh, receptors that are going to be associated with sour and maybe some salt as well. So again, here's salty, right? It's going to be sodium, for example, coming in to the ion uh, channel. You also have acids, which are going to respond to your hydrogen protons. A hydrogen ion is going to come in. That's going to detect an acidic type of flavor. Um, that can also interact with the uh, potassium channels as well. So when you have hydrogen coming in, that could also affect those potassium channels. And then your G protein coupled receptors are going to be associated with like sweet, uh, umame, as well as bitter flavors. So, you know, be familiar with these different types of receptors and what flavors they might be associated with. Um, here are other receptors as well. TASR, that's like taste receptor. So you have your, your TASR1 and TASR2. And those are going to be involving second messenger systems, activating IP3, right, causing a downstream cascade of effects. And then eventually, so here's like the pathway. So you have TAS1 receptor or TAS2 being activated. You get IP3. Then you have uh, uh, cyto- uh, calcium is going to be 
uh, released into the cytoplasm. And then you get voltage gated sodium channels basically opening up. Then you get depolarization. Then you get more calcium coming out of the endoplasmic reticulum, which allows for ATP ultimately to be involved in like the final uh, perception of taste. Now, in terms of extraoral taste receptors, so extraoral taste receptors, that would be your pharynx, that would be your uh, esophagus, right? the upper portion of your esophagus, cranial nerve 10. Um, these are considered sentinels. And what are sentinels? They're going to be associating with uh, detection of chemicals that should not be in your body. Right? So one example would be uh, gram-negative bacteria. So if you get gram-negative bacteria reaching your, for example, uh, respiratory epithelia, you're going to have these types of extraoral taste receptors detecting the bacteria. And they're like, oh, wow, the, the, this bacteria should not be here. Right? We need to get this bacteria out. And so it's basically going to trigger your cilia to start beating even more aggressively to get all that stuff out. Right? So these taste receptors are not just for detecting flavor of foods and things like that. It could also be detecting the flavor of something that's pathogenic, right? So cool stuff. Um, don't worry about all of the different types of receptors associated with different, uh, you know, ligands. So like different types of bacteria, different types of irritants, different proteins, toxins, etc., and what the effect is going to be. But just be kind of familiar with the these extra oral receptors and kind of what the main uh, goal is right, when you activate these. It's basically like they serve as a protective type mechanism. So pretty cool stuff. <clears throat> so again, here's your cranial nerve 7, 9, and 10. They're going to be uh, synapsing at the solitary nucleus or the nucleus solitarius or the nucleus of the solitary tract. Any of those terms are totally fine. They're all interchangeable. Then they're going to reach up to the thalamus, right? So that from the thalamus, they're going to be able to reach up to the cortical regions where you can finally get like processing of those taste information. And then again, you get bi-directional communication between limbic system as well as those cortical regions. So you can figure out how you're going to respond to those actual flavors right, that you're detecting from what's what you're eating. Now, this is, uh, these are a couple theories on how these taste receptors work, right? There's a couple different theories. One is the labeling line coding. And so what does the labeling line coding mean? It means that you have one type of receptor uh, associated with one pathway of neurons, right? You get one receptor, like a sweet, like it's detecting sweet only. And then it's going to send that one signal that's detecting sweet to the cervical nerve ganglia, which gets sent to the brainstem, thalamus, and the cortex. And then that one taste now just was associated with one region in the brain that's just saying, oh, this is sweet, right? So that's going to be labeling line coding. So different types of flavors would have a single pathway versus the other theory is uh, a cross neuron pattern. And a cross neuron pattern is probably, in my opinion, the more realistic of these, right? It's where you have basically a like a it's like a constellation of different flavors. It's like a mosaic pattern of flavors, right? And so you're getting detection of all sorts of different types of flavors. They're all cross uh, connecting in terms of like synaptic connections and getting processed all together simultaneously, right? That's probably like one of the more realistic. That's probably the more realistic theory of those two. But who knows? Maybe the first one is is correct. So here's what it would look like in terms of like gustatory cortex and how it's like finely processed. So you might either see kind of like, a, you know, distinct individual regions that correspond to distinct flavors versus uh, more of like a mosaic type of pattern. All right. Now, in terms of temporal coding, the specific time at which each action potential occurs. So you're going to see uh, increasing or decreasing firing of each taste as it, uh, uh, as it gets presented to 
your afferent neurons. And so they're going to be associated with different types of spikes on like the neural signal. Um, and then you also have a, uh, uh, was a multi-phasic firing rate change. So neurons might fire at high rates, they might slow down, uh, and a lot of these different effects are going to be associated with emotional uh, perception of flavors, right? So again, this is another bit of research that's more FYI. If you want to read more into it, feel free to do so, where you can see like temporal coding and kind of like different types of somatosensory uh, reactions that you might have to those different types of flavors. So the labeled line, as well as the across neuron pattern codes, they're both kind of being considered as valid theories, right? But apparently it's going to depend on the actual context. Um, so a cross neuron uh, pattern uh, might be associated with low to high levels of uh, arousal, whereas the, um, yeah, I don't know. There's just different theories. They're still kind of figuring out exactly what's going on. Right? It's still kind of up in the air, but those are the two major theories. Okay, cross neural pattern versus the labeled line theory. All right, now, in terms of flavor, um, you get a lot of different senses involved in taste, right? It's not just the tastes of the uh, you know, sweet, sour, umami, et cetera. It can also be the texture as well, right? So salty, crunchy, um, heat is going to be really important, right? So different changes of temperature are going to be super important. Um, so in other words, it's, you know, lots of different factors come into play when it comes to gustation which I could imagine would be coming into play here with this gentleman eating a, I don't know what kind of bug that is, a cricket or something. Yeah. Anyone in here ever eat insects before? I went, uh, it's a mental breather. This was 10 years ago. I was, I was a member of the Explorers Club and they do uh, this annual gala. It's like a really cool event where they have like people from all walks of society. I'm talking mountain height, like people that have climbed the toss of Mount Everest. So like I'm talking like professional explorers that have gone to the deepest parts of the ocean, the tallest peaks. Some even uh, like astronauts would go to these like events. Like I actually shook the hands of Buzz Aldrin when I was there. So Buzz Aldrin, the first, uh, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong were like the first guys to evidently go to the moon, if you believe in that. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, but um, uh, one of my friends was like, dude, that's Buzz Aldrin. You got to go over there and shake his hand. I'm like, I'm not going to go shake. He's like, trust me, you want to go over there and shake his hand. And so Buzz was like leaving with his wife. So I like ran over. I'm like, hey, uh, Buzz Aldrin. And he like turns around. I'm like, uh, can I shake your hand? And he looked so pissed off. And he's like put his hand out and shook my hand. And I was like, wow, I got him so angry. <laughs> but I shook his hand and I went back. I'm like, yeah, he was really mad at me. He's like, well, you shook his hand though. That's, really... <laughs> that's, that's going to stay with you forever. Um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson was one of the keynote speakers at the event. So really like famous astrophysicist. Lots of really incredible people there. Um, I mean, Neil Armstrong was a member of the Explorers Club. Um, uh, some of my favorite, John Muir, who's the guy that like basically founded... Um, Yosemite National Park. So like lots of incredible people part of the Explorers Club. So some people think when they hear Explorers Club, it's like a Boy Scouts Club or something. Yeah. It's not a Boy Scouts Club. It is like, these are hardcore people. Yeah, it's amazing. So Teddy Theodore Roosevelt, I'm pretty sure was a member of the Explorers Club. And they have like this cool little flag. So whenever they go places, they'll like put a flag at the place that they go visit. Um, so anyways, long story short, they have these animal events and it's like a black tie affair. You go, everyone's like dressed to the nines. It's like such a cool event. And it was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and in the, um, like the Natural History Museum. And so we're in this like really beautiful building in New York and they had bug chefs. And so they were cooking tarantulas, they were cooking insects, they were cooking crickets, they were cooking all sorts of weird bugs. and. It was just like all these people dressed up in like their three piece suits, like black tie affair, freaking eating bugs. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, oh yeah, totally. Yeah, like um, the, there was the crickets that I took home. I took a couple packets. There was, there were, uh, what was it? It was like, there were stacked, they weren't chocolate covered. No, they were like 
barbecued. It was like a, some sort of barbecue seasoning. They were actually pretty good. The only thing that I didn't like about it is that the legs get like stuck in your gums. So you're like pulling like the <laughs> legs out. So. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I still have a packet of that of the staghorn kid, uh, staghorn uh, crickets. They were pretty decent, pretty funny. <laughs> I'm not like a huge advocate of eating the bugs. I know a lot of people are like trying to save the environment. They're like, hey, let's eat bugs now instead of like steak and stuff. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> I'm cool with eating bugs at like the Explorers Club gala, but that's about <laughs> it. <laughs> I'm not gonna do it as like a thing. So. Here are different types of reactions that you might have to uh, different smells and flavors. So this is how these things get integrated. This is how smell and taste gets integrated. So you have um, orthonasal olfaction. That's when you're like smelling food, right? It's like external, you're just smelling it. Then you have retronasal olfaction. And that's, happens, that's happening when you eat it, right? So when you're eating the food, you're smelling it at the same time, right? And that's how like smell and taste are really like tightly linked together. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why smelling a stinky piece of cheese that's like is by all you know accounts repulsive, that's only gonna be associating with the like external type of olfaction, orthonasal, versus when you actually start eating it, then you have that retronasal olfaction. And so the flavor basically changes because of that. And so they're gonna share very similar pathways and they're all gonna be associated, for example, with like, you know, at some point reaching the, the thalamus. Smell will bypass the thalamus, but eventually it's going to communicate with the thalamus, right? It doesn't get directly uh, sifted through the thalamus, whereas taste does, right? So you're going to associate smells with tastes. And this is kind of how your limbic system is able to, you know, communicate with the hypothalamus and the amygdala. So you can see what the memory is of different smells and associate that with flavors, for example. So these are all the different regions in the brain that are going to be associated with that. So you've got all the different nerves associated with smell, um, not just seven, nine, and 10, but also five when it comes to textures and things like that. Then you have your olfactory bulb, the, olf the uh, orbital frontal cortex which is going to be processing smells, for example, um, the nucleus, uh, the solitarius of the uh, brainstem, right? All those regions are all going to be coming into play to help process smell and taste. Now, again, uh, insular cortex is going to be really important in uh, all of these perceptions. So this is, uh, they did some fMRI studies as part of this particular uh, example, and they're looking at the gustatory cortex lighting up when it comes to both flavor and smell, right? So taste and olfaction. So insular cortex is going to be very much associated with that. Um, and the other thing that's kind of interesting is that if you present somebody with a smell versus a taste, it's still going to light up that same area in the brain, the insula, right? So smell and taste are very, very intimately linked together. So this is where we closed off last time. Uh, we were talking about uh, chemesthesis. We were also talking about the gustatory cortex. So let's kind of rewind a little bit and talk again about the gustatory cortex. That's going to be for both taste as well as olfaction. And so um, literally, if you taste something and if you smell something, it should elicit similar responses in uh, brain regions that are corresponding to smell and taste. Uh, in this case, the insular cortex. So you're going to find the gustatory uh, regions in the insular cortex will actually light up just from the smell, for example, of strawberries. So if you taste it, if you smell it, it's almost like the same thing. So think about that next time you go to the bathroom. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Talking to public bathroom. <laughs> uh, the grossest thing about that is that uh, uh, whenever there was studies done, like whenever a toilet is flushed, there's like, uh, what's it called? It's not like, it's not actual like droplets, but it's even smaller than that. It's like it aerosolizes. It aerosolizes things into the air and that's how you smell things right so you are literally smelling those kinds of like particles from whatever it is that produced that smell so gross right <laughs> um and the fact that it, it, it stimulates the same regions in the brain is absolutely wild 
Yeah. But when you think about the good things like strawberries and flavorful things, things that are nice and pleasant, then it's nice, right? It's a very uh, good thing to think about. So chemesthesis, you're going to see the trigeminal neurons being involved in this. So taste is going to involve, remember the cranial nerves? Actually, you guys tell me, which cranial nerves? Ten, good. But the trigeminal nerve is also going to be involved in that. Which which cranial nerve is the trigeminal nerve? Five. Five, good. Yeah, be, exactly. So when you're feeling the, the sensations, the textures, right, that's going to be stimulating cranial nerve number five. So you get trigeminal neurons being involved in that. So if something's hot or something's cold, also the textures of the, the thing that you're consuming. And these are all the different types of uh, receptors that are going to respond to different types of flavors, for example. We already discussed chili peppers, which involve the TRPV1 receptor, the transient receptor uh, potential uh, receptor. And you also have other receptors that are going to be in a similar family being associated with different types of flavors. So like garlic, mint, bitterness, those are all using TRPV type receptors or TRPM and TRPA receptors. So that's chemesthesis, right? So it's basically the sensation of something that has to do with chemicals, right? Thesis means a sensation, right? Something that stimulates those special senses. Chem, right? Chemical. So chemical response. Now, again, trigeminal nerve is going to be heavily involved in this, right? So the gustatory and trigeminal nerves uh, being involved in taste sensation and why are they uh, so intimately linked? It's because of proximity. The fibers are actually physically close to each other. And so there's going to be interaction between trigeminal sensation and gustatory sensation. Something else too that's interesting, like capsaicin. Remember, we talked about capsaicin, which stimulates the TRPV1 receptor, literally gives you the sensation of actual physical heat. Not just that, but capsaicin is also found to release substance P. What does substance P do? Pain. Yeah, absolutely, which can be blocked by opioids. <clears throat> so in other words, you're going to have lots of cross-communication between different receptor types and different special senses. Again, food texture stimulates mechanoreceptors. So literally, you feel the actual sensation. Um, something else also that's, you know, interesting to keep in mind is that mechanoreceptors, those are the very first thing. So the sensation of texture is the very first thing that your brain perceives, even before flavor. Have you guys ever had an experience where like, there's something that you really like, but the texture was just really off and it was gross? Just gonna ask about that, yeah. yeah, so once you put something in your mouth, that's the first thing that your brain perceives is texture before all else. It's before salt, before bitter, before any of those other flavors. Right, the texture is, that's why texture is so important in food. Sounds and images are also going to be important in food. Remember, when you see food or you think of food or you smell food, you're starting to see gastric motility beginning, right? You start getting gastrin release from the G cells within the stomach that helps to basically prepare the stomach for a meal, right? That's when you, when you see a tasty burger, like maybe one of these items off of the heart attack grill menu, right? You got the quadruple bypass burger. You look at that and you're thinking, wow, that looks delicious. I want to eat that right now. And so you start to salivate, right? Your stomach starts to churn a little bit. Actually looking at that burger, your stomach might be churning, but for different reasons. <laughs> so the heart attack grill, by the way, have you guys heard of the heart attack grill before? Heart attack grill was actually founded here in Phoenix, in Scottsdale. And they uh, shut down because one of their main spokespersons uh, literally died of a heart attack. Um, and so they're actually located now in Las Vegas. And they have all these different hilarious names like coronary dog, the double and triple and quadruple bypass burgers. Their fries are called flatline fries, <laughs> um, butterfat shake. And all the people that work there, the ladies have to wear nurse outfits. The customers, when they come in, they have to change. They have to wear hospital gowns, and they go onto a scale. I think they weigh, weigh themselves before and after they eat, so they go onto a scale. If they don't finish all their food, they get spanked by the nurses with paddle boards. 
<laughs> so this place is ridiculous. Um, anyway, so sounds and images, right? So whenever you think of food and all that, you're starting to get like all that stimuli, right? Visual stimuli. And that's going to basically trigger the expectation of what you're about to eat, right? Um, other things can come into play. Brand names. Also, seeing somebody else's reaction to food is going to influence the way you perceive the way that food tastes. That's very negative. Yeah, totally. So if somebody is like totally repulsed by something, you're going to be like, ugh, that might be actually repulsive. And if right? it has to do with an insulin, that makes sense too. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, so the insula is going to be playing a role in this, but also other regions too, like the, the limbic system plays a role in this too. Right, amygdala, hippocampus, all of that. Oh yeah, I mean, I don't think it's gonna be. It's not gonna be the. Oh, oh, you mean the perception? Uh, I don't think it has to do with these specific regions that have to do with gust uh, gustatory sensations. But that's absolutely true, right? A lot of that has to do with like social status. Right. I was even listening to this really interesting uh, interview the other day about people in the Middle East. They have these like a lot. There's, there's like certain cities. Where they're really rich. Like everybody has a Land Rover. Everybody has a G-Wagon. So it's not like a status symbol anymore if everybody has it. So they actually have license plates. The shorter the license plate, the more expensive. Right. The more it costs to get so that people literally will use a license plate like the numbers, the amount of numbers on there to you know, signal wealth and status, that right? Yeah. Really? They knew that the person that owned the vehicle was wealthy. Yeah. They probably thought you guys were wealthy. They're yeah. like, oh, what's going on over here? Yeah. So that's about status. I think when somebody, there's like that perceived attraction when everyone's like, oh, wow, that person's like so attractive. Like there's, it's a status thing, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it necessarily has to do with a lot of these brain regions. It's more like a, that's a, more of like a psychological thing. I was so. going to say, I just saw this thing too. It's actually Jordan Peterson who was talking about it. And it was like talking about like men and women sexual fantasies. And one of the things he was talking about is like status is one of the most common trends you can see. Like it, it varies different stuff. Absolutely. Like that's one of the things. It Absolutely. Like, it's like, oh, that's kind of. Absolutely. Really thinking like that for a really long time. Absolutely. So. And it's interesting too, because uh, they've even done some studies that looked at what a lot of women find attractive. Like some of the tropes are going to be like surgeon. That's right? what it was talking about. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of these like uh, character, a lot of these types of like individuals will have more of a bend towards like sociopathy a little bit. Cause like uh, they, they found that a lot of people who go into surgery tend to have traits of like sociopathy. Makes a lot right. of sense. Yeah, because they're turning their desire to like hurt into a des like the ability to like fix people right yeah. through surgery, and so yeah, really interesting studies. Yeah, it's really interesting. And like, yeah. it's probably pretty hard to see certain stuff. And then I have friends that are like, no offense, I have friends that are like nurses or going into stuff, and I'm yeah. like, you guys have like a weird insensitivity to certain things. Well, that's uh, probably because you have to. Well, you have to. You it's through exposure. Right. Like when I was in med school, like I would literally be looking at the most disgusting things you could possibly imagine while studying while like eating my lunch. Yeah. And I even like caught myself once being like, wow, that is so weird that I'm like literally looking at maybe like necrotizing fasciitis or something like that I while mean, eating my lunch. Yeah. Really? Because yeah. it looks a lot like turkey, doesn't it? It looks so much like turkey. Yeah. And pork. <laughs> Yeah, you're fine now. You get used to it. You yeah, really do. Yeah, you know, this is back on that thing because I am not a practicing person, and then my friend was like, you know, he's actually getting cute. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That is so funny. And there's, there's been other studies done where, like, if you're, if you're going out, um, a lot of people will rate you by the average of the people you're with. So if you go out and like you're out with like a bunch of like really attractive individuals, you will also be perceived as being more attractive. Also, if a guy is seen with a very attractive female, but he's really like 
know, maybe not that good looking. People will att- will perceive him as being maybe more attractive yeah. because of that. Dude, so okay. not, to, not to say anything weird, but I had a very attractive ex girlfriend, and I like objectively speaking, and the girls that I worked with, like normal whatever talking whatever, and then as soon as they would see a picture of her, they'd be like, "You have a hot girlfriend." Like, Thank you. And then suddenly the conversation shifts, and I was like, "This is really weird." And then somebody told me about that thing. That, yeah. Like, Suddenly, people think, "Oh, like this person has more worth to them because yeah. the person they're with is attractive." It's all about perceptions. It's so it is. It's value perception. Absolutely, absolutely. Same thing with brand names. I mean, just even thinking about brand names, right? Brand names, like, like I don't care about brand names personally, but that's just me. I grew up punk rock, so I'm just like, you know, if if, if other people thought I was cool, I usually be like, "That's not cool." <laughs> like, do the opposite. But you know, brand names. That's it. Says a lot. Like. If you have a Rolex, people are like, oh, wow, it's a Rolex. It's like, who cares? It's a freaking watch that tells you yeah. time. But anyways, that so that was a total uh, uh, digression, which I really, really like. Cause it, it, deals with, it does deal with tastes, taste to a certain uh, uh, regard or to, to a certain extent. Yeah, so, But yeah, the insular cortex in general, I mean, you have those von Economo neurons in the insula, and those are mirror neurons, right? So... It makes sense that not only is the amygdala or sorry, the insula involved in things like empathy, pro-social relatedness and whatnot, but it's also involved in taste perception as well. So insula is a really interesting structure in the brain. That's for sure. Now, the gustatory uh, cortex and the insular cortex, that's where you get a lot of those uh, taste sensations uh, integrated. And again, the limbic system is going to play a role in this. So the amygdala, as well as the thalamus, is going to be playing a role in that. Um, the insular cortex is going to be sensitive to expressions of disgust. You see somebody who's disgusted by something, your insula is going to be sensitive to that type of perception. Um, and then these areas are going to be associated with a predictive type value. So you anticipate what the actual stimulation is going to be like once you experience it firsthand. So again, you have your three major cranial nerves coming in. They communicate with a solitary nucleus or the nucleus of the solitary tract. Um, That's going to communicate with the thalamus, right? But these regions are also all communicating with the limbic system. You've got the hypothalamus, the amygdala, and you have the insular and the frontal uh, gustatory cortex talking with the, the hypothalamus and the amygdala, and you're getting back and forth communication. So it's like bi-directional communication, right? So these, all these regions are working in tandem together. So cool stuff. Now, this is a total side note. I'm not going to play this full video because this video is, su- is not super long, but it is super cool. I really recommend watching this when you guys get a chance. It's a TED Talk. Um, David Pizarro is a researcher that looks at the role of disgust and how disgust actually shapes a lot of our human behavior, not just individually, but at a societal level. Um, and it's been found through some of his studies that if you, for example, uh, subject individuals to really foul smells, it will literally make the person more socially conservative. Now, uh, generally speaking, individuals with more of like a liberal type bend will be uh, have a little less disgust sensitivity versus people who have more of a conservative type bend. They are more heightened. Uh, they have a heightened sensitivity to disgust. Um, now, they've been, they did studies where like, they literally they would have test subjects fill out questionnaires, uh, in particular, like their perceptions of, for example, things that might be a little controversial, like homosexuality. And then they would also subject that individual to really foul smells in the room, and people would become more homophobic, basically, while they're like, filling out these question surveys. So really, really interesting stuff. Also, um, impact on political beliefs, like um, I, the idea of being afraid of the other, right? like xenophobia, being afraid of foreigners or whatever, a lot of that has to do with these disgust mechanisms because you know, it is true that historically in the past, people that come into contact for the first time might uh, expose each other to novel viruses, novel diseases. I mean, that happened when the Americas were initially colonized by the Europeans. They brought, what, smallpox, right? And then also Europeans got syphilis from folks that lived here in the Americas. So it worked both ways. Like people here got smallpox, but in exchange, 
they gave syphilis to the Europeans. So really, really interesting, interesting stuff. This basically boils down to survival mechanisms, right? Trying to protect you and people in your community from, uh, for, I, I guess, threats from other places. So really, really interesting research. So I, I highly recommend watching that video. I think it's about, I want to say eight to 10 minutes long. So it's not terribly long, but that guy's research is super fascinating. Another aspect of sounds and images, right? You got your anticipatory neural responses. Now think about Pavlov's dog, right? This has to do with anticipation. So in other words, you anticipate that you're going to eat. You know, the dogs do this, but we do it too. Like when I was talking about a delicious burger a moment ago, I actually just found myself salivating a little bit. When I love, I love peppers. And when I think about peppers like serrano peppers or malagueta peppers or habaneros, I literally, like I'm salivating right now just thinking about it because I love peppers. So that's like literally your brain and your thoughts like basically influencing your digestive system. So pretty amazing stuff. So basically you're just preparing the cortex for that gustatory stimulus. And you also have uh, uh, food-related actions that are going to be based on expectation. This all has to do with hedonic value-based visual cues. Yeah. That's a quick question, too. So I, when I was doing research for another class, one of the things I saw was that they have a like, proposed model of the brain that is like, we actually like predict reality at all times and mm. we try and fit it to our thing. Mm. I can't remember exactly what it's called. Oh, it's gosh. a theory. It's not like proven. But right. That is like this kind of thing. Where it's like you and like the brain, it's for energy efficiency purposes. Like yeah. The brain paints the picture. Yeah. And then it tries to fit the picture closest to it so that That's it doesn't have to change too much stuff. It's like selectively filtering out yeah. yep. as, like aspects of the environment. I wish right. I remembered the name of it too, so I can tell you. But. Well, the idea, a lot of people propose, like uh, there's this guy that I've been listening to or reading recently, um, uh, Ian uh, McGillicrist, who's a psychiatrist and also like a philosopher as well. And um, in an interview that he was having, actually with Dr. Jordan Peterson, they were basically discussing how the brain serves as a filtration uh, uh, unit, right? It's filtering out uh, extraneous information from the environment so that you can basically focus in on the things that are the most important, right? That's all part of cognitive neuropsych, and it's a really fascinating field, right? There's so much stuff in the environment that we aren't able to truly give attention to because attention is something that is... You know, we have only a limited amount of attention. And then right. what's the, because I've heard the argument that like people who have schizophrenia or those other disorders, essentially their filtration isn't as yep. good. Absolutely. So like, They're getting all sorts of stimulus from all over the place. That's why they can actually see things that aren't really there. Yeah. Or like are they there? Yeah. yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of, it's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Super interesting stuff. Let's watch a little video on Pavlov's dog. Pavlov's aim was to discover what caused saliva to flow. He rerouted the saliva ducts to the outside of his dog's cheek so that he could collect and measure the spittle. Perhaps, he thought, the production of saliva might be the result of a fixed nervous reflex, like a knee jerk. Okay. Yes, we know. So great and After taking many measurements of spittle, he confirmed that the dogs drooled automatically when their tongues touched food. He called the response the salivation reflex. But his work started to run into trouble. As his dogs became familiar with the experimental routine, they started to fill their cheek tubes before Pavlov had a chance to stimulate their tongues. The dogs were learning to anticipate food. Pavlov tried a new technique. He erected screens so that the dogs couldn't see what was going on. Before passing meat through the hatch, he introduced a stimulus that was totally unrelated to feeding. A ticking metronome. First, the dog dripped saliva into its cheek tube 
only when the food appeared. But after a number of trials, the dog began to connect the ticking with the arrival of meat. Soon the sound alone made the dog draw. Eventually, the dog salivated as much to the ticking itself as it did originally to the presentation of food. On there! Did you see that? Hmm? He called this new response the conditioned reflex. <laughs> So you get the idea. So that's classical conditioning, right? Crazy how he accidentally figured that out. I know. It's awesome. That is so yeah, sweet. it is totally accidental. It was not a deliberate experiment whatsoever. So really, really cool stuff. So, I mean, that happens to all of us. It happens to our pets, right? Even like my pet guinea pig, the useless little Wilbur that we have. My, it's my wife's animal. Um, like whenever I would like open up a bag of anything and you, you would hear the little crinkles, it would start squeaking from its cage. I'm like, what the hell? It's not food for you, dude. This is for me. <laughs> so <laughs> hilarious. And guinea pigs, by the way, they squeak really loud. They like a little queakly sound. It's kind of cute. Actually, it's, it's super cute. Now, again, the hedonic uh, reflexes, hedonic value of taste is going to be important for the survivability of infants, for example. Um, infants, when they're exposed to, for example, mom's milk, they also get the scent that's coming from mom. They associate uh, like the scents coming from like the areola with their own mother, right? So you can actually see that they're going to protrude their tongue. They might even have like a latch type of reflex. Um, in, this, in these studies, they uh, subjected the uh, individuals to sugar, right? And sugar is pleasant, so you would get a tongue pr protrusion. Um, not just in humans, but also in orangutans. The orangutans did almost exact same type of thing. They would do a tongue protrusion. And rodents do the same thing too. In this bottom image over here, you got tongue protrusion. Not only that, but also like the tongue was just wiggling around, like lateral protrusion to the sensation of anything sweet. Now, on the other hand, if you give an individual the taste of bitterness, then you have basically like kind of like a gag reflex. Not necessarily a gag reflex here, but they would basically open in their mouth. They would like gape their mouth open and be like kind of grossed out. So that was kind of like the repulsive reflex to the flavor of bitter. Now, why bitterness in particular would be something that would elicit such a strong emotion? Spoiled? No, not spoiled actually. Spoilage often tastes sour. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, so spoiled foods often taste sour. Mm -mm. What do poison taste like? Most poisons taste bitter. Yeah, so bitterness basically elicits a very profound emotional reaction. So like for this case, you see like kind of like a gape reflex, gag reflex, right? So bitterness would be perceived as something to be avoided altogether. And that's like not even a taut response, right? These are infants. These are super young test subjects. Right. Even it's like it's a uh, it's deeply ingrained in our perception of bitter uh, flavors. So, again, uh, the gustatory system is going to be very much uh, intertwined with the limbic system. In the limbic system, you're going to have a couple different areas. You have the amygdala, uh, but you also have other regions, too, like the ventral tegmental area. The VTA ventral tegmental area is what produces dopamine for this system. And so, in other words, dopamine is going to be part of that whole hedonic pleasure-seeking pathway, right? So you're seeking out something that's rewarding. And things that taste good, generally speaking, would be things that were like of nutritious value, right? So this whole entire system obviously can get hijacked nowadays, right? We deal with a serious obesity epidemic. We have lots of diabetes, lots of hypertension, and a lot of that has to do with lifestyle. But... For the most part, this system is important for your survival, right? You want to seek out things that are good, and you're going to be rewarded for that by this pathway. So know the ventral tegmental area and how it plays a role in the, uh, the limbic system and the gustatory pathways. You also get the ventral sci striatum involved in this. So there's lots of different regions involved in this. But dopamine, dopaminergic pathway is going to be very much a key player here as well. 
<clears throat> Moving on. Here are some uh, other aspects of learning about flavors and tastes. Uh, your, your tastes are going to evolve over time. Things that you thought were really repulsive as a child are really nice as an adult, right? Lots of kids don't really like things like broccoli, right? You know, a lot of adults they grow to love broccoli. Like, I absolutely love broccoli. I didn't really like it as a kid, but I do love it now, right? And so change, things change over time. Also, uh, people sometimes are afraid of the unknown. So that's called neophobia, right? Scared of what's new which is completely fine, right? That's a natural thing. That's part of like our survival mechanisms. We see something that looks maybe a little odd, looks a little strange, right? And then we finally actually have it and we realize that it's really good for you, right? Here in the United States, in the Western world, we have a lot of mycophobia, which is like fear of things like fungi and mushrooms. Whereas in certain parts of the world, like in East Asia, in Russia, they have more of a mycophilia, in Asia, they, they go harvest mushrooms all the time for their own cuisine and stuff. So super interesting how even culturally you might see this at like in a mass scale, lots of people being afraid of similar things. Um, if you want to hide something that might not taste great, you can do what we call mixture suppression. So if you don't like drinking coffee black, you know, a lot of people like to doctor their coffees up, turn them into basically like little sugary desserts. Right? You go to Starbucks, you don't just get black coffee, you get a bunch of other crap added into it. Like, I like my coffee black, but you know, most, I understand that most people don't. I also heard that people who drink black coffee are psychopaths, so I don't know. I guess I'm a psychopath. Um, associative learning, um, this is where you're pairing a smell with a taste. Right? So now you're learning how to associate smells with tastes, and that's something that you can continue to lear learn throughout your life. And again, that... That's what sommeliers do, right? They're literally like smelling, they smell the wine, then they taste it, and then they can also figure out even what region of the world these grapes are harvest, harvested from. Now, here is the social transmission of food preference. Um, individuals that have never been exposed to food before and might have neophobia, they can overcome that by watching other individuals doing something similar, like eating something similar. So in this study, they took a, uh, a rat, they put co uh, chocolate into its food. So they had chocolate fl flavored chow. Now a naive rodent that never had chocolate flav flavored chow before walks up and smells the rodent that ate uh, that chocolate flavored chow. And it basically learns that it's okay to have chocolate flavored chow. As a matter of fact, they might even prefer to have chocolate flavored, flavored chow compared to any other types of foods, right? So they learn how to do that by communicating with each other through like scent and sensory perception. <clears throat> and then there's also a phenomenon called conditioned taste aversion. Um, this is how you might experience something really negative relating to a food, and now you really have an aversion to it. This happened to me when I was a very young kid we went to a restaurant, I had grilled fish, and I got really sick that night. It wasn't the fish, I just got the flu, right? But when I got sick, I associated that illness with eating a grilled fish, baked fish. And for probably 15 years, I could barely eat grilled fish. Another thing happened as well when I got sick on tequila. I got really, really sick on tequila once, like borderline alcohol toxic or poisoning, and I literally couldn't even smell anything that had agave in it for years. I love agave spirits now, but back in those days for about 10 years, I couldn't even smell it. It would make me feel really nauseous, right? So that is conditioned taste aversion. Um, again, the amygdala plays an extremely important role in this, right? Because you're basically trying to figure out if the thing that you're smelling or tasting is poisonous, right? That's one of the reason why Things that are tasting very bitter, for example, that indicates that it might be poison versus things that taste sour, they might be spoiled. This happened not too long ago. It was like last, sometime last year. Um, we had, we went to a Mexican restaurant and like the food was awesome. We got like quesadillas and stuff. And my wife also made quesadillas that same week. And so I was like going through the fridge and I ate the one that we bought from the restaurant like oh, two weeks prior. And I was like, yeah, it tastes kind of like, I thought it was lime. And we put lime on it. And then I was like, 
which one is this? This is not the one my wife made. Oh my God, I think this is the one from the restaurant two weeks ago. And so I texted her, I was like, uh, which quesadilla is the one that you made? And so she told me it was like the other one. <laughs> and like, but it tasted sour. It tasted like lime, but it wasn't lime. It was like totally spoiled. So I had to, you know, make myself, like, you know, I'm not going to say anything gross. I was going to say, how'd you feel? I, just, I had to like go to the, as soon as she told me that, I was like, oh my God, I better get this out of me. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. Okay. Absolutely. Because by the time your body says, oh, this is actually really like rancid, like it's going to be too late. You're going to be really sick. Okay. And I was totally fine after that. Like okay. no issue whatsoever. So yeah, if it's totally spoiled or rotten, I would highly suggest getting it out of your system ASAP. Okay. So here is a uh, conditioned uh, aversion studies in a uh, rat. They paired a new taste. So in this case, it was saccharin, which is sweet. But they also paired it with uh, something that would affect their stomach and would cause uh, gastric malaise. So it would give them basically upset stomach. After doing that, then the rat basically associated that sweet saccharin solution with the feeling of being nauseous. Right? So this would be another example of uh, taste aversion, conditioned taste aversion. Again, amygdala is very important that as well as the gustatory uh, cortex. So, by the way, I, I finished a lot of these quizzes questions already. There's only a couple new ones that I'm building out. So most of those are ready. Like if you want to go back to those previous lectures and go through those on your own time, feel free to do that. Let's go ahead and log in. We'll do maybe like one or two of these questions and then move on to movement. Anybody lose sunglasses? No? There's only five of us today. It's amazing. I know someone is sick. Someone else. I think someone else. I think two of you guys got sick this week. I was sick all week too. So Were you? Oh man, I hope I don't get sick again. <laughs> it's too many times. <laughs> yeah. When you're surrounded by so many people. So that should have been a softball question. Obviously, we just talked about it. So yeah, conditioned taste aversion. Okay, so in other words, they got really sick from the thing that they tasted, and now they associate that thing with that sensation of being really ill. So let's do one more, and then we'll move on to movement. So you're literally going to find taste buds everywhere here, tongue, pharynx, esophagus, and the soft palate. The gums here, you don't have any taste buds. All right, good job on that. I'm going to end it now. Please, please do the rest of those questions.